Hi, everybody. It's Bob Ose. This is the Theater Resources Unlimited True Community Gathering, uh, which we do every Friday at uh, 5, 5.30. We, we open the room at 5 o'clock, and we bring our guests on at 5.30. Um, if anybody out there in YouTube and, to, and podcast land uh, want to join us and be part of the conversation and ask questions and be part of the community, we'd love to have you. Uh, you can always email me at trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com, and we will gladly send you a link every week so you can be with us. Um, we started doing this, this is I think our 100, 143rd consecutive week of community gatherings, um, and um, we started doing this as a as a response to COVID. Basically, it was it was a survival tactic. Um, it, it was either close my company or find a way to make my company function virtually, which is something I'm probably going to be talking to about uh, my guest about today as well. Um, and uh, <laughs> luckily, I had people who held my hand and, and introduced me to Zoom and and. I didn't run away and I did it and we started on April 17th and we started talking about everything we could possibly talk about uh, that uh, being creative during during COVID, during a shutdown. And we talked about what the hell is a shutdown? What is quarantine? How come we're in quarantine? What is that? Um, and uh, the co conversations have evolved um, in the past year or so because um, we've re-entered, well, we've left quarantine um, for better or for worse, we've left quarantine. Uh, and uh, although I, I do this every week, I remind you all that COVID is still with us. I still have friends who are getting COVID all the time. And um, we'd still need to be cautious. I, I went to the Philharmonic last night. I wore my mask. Um, I think about 20 or 30% of the audience is now still wear masks. But um, for me, it just it just makes me feel a little, a little safer. Um, so now that we're coming out of COVID, one thing I want to say about being forced to go into Zoom, Theater Resources Unlimited, Unlimited has always been a Manhattan-based organization. And most of the community that we served was really in the New York area, or at least the tri-state area. Going into virtual, as evidenced by even the people in the room today, we have people from all over the all over the country now. Um, in fact, New Yorkers today, you're in a minority in this in this community gathering. Uh, there are way far more people from outside of New York. Um, today, we don't happen to have anybody from Europe and and Australia and uh, other other places around Malaysia. We get Singapore, but we do get a lot of those people now. So. One of the things that I've decided to do over the course of this sh shutdown that we've been going through is um, think more globally. Um, and today is part of my thinking, not necessarily globally, but thinking more in terms of, of around the theater, around the country. I've been bringing in for you to meet uh, artistic directors and people that run uh, theater companies all over the, all over the United States. Um, and it's part of my plan. I'm going to continue doing that. Uh, it's many of us need to be reminded. I, by, I, by the way, I'm I'm a playwright. As as in addition to whatever I do here uh, with True, um, a lot of us need to be reminded that there are markets for our work outside of of New York, uh, and not everybody is going to make it to Broadway. Nor does everybody need to be on Broadway. So um, today I'm I have a guest from um, a small theater outside of New York, a small theater in South Carolina. And um, I very much wanted to, to hear his conversation. I wanted to hear him talk about his company, how he runs it, and how things are going for him down there in, in Green, Green Hills. I think it's Green Hill, is that right? I'm gonna bring on Mike Sablone now. Mike Sablone, hi. Hello, it's Greenville. Greenville, Greenville. Greenville, South Carolina. I have my notes somewhere, but I, I, <laughs> they're, they're hidden right now. Um, totally okay. But I got I got the pronunciation pronunciation of your name right. You're one for two. I uh, that's that's a great batting average. Well, thank you. Five hundred. You're in the Hall of Fame. So welcome to the True Community Gathering, Mike. I, when I asked you this, you probably were thinking, "What am I going to talk to these people about?" Um, you probably thought this is a New York company, and you know, 
what what do I have to sh to share with them? We have a lot because we have people here in this room from all over the country. I think you you have people actually not not so far from where you are, um, and we also have people that are intellectually curious about about our business. Um, that's why we're here. We're here as a uh, to to help people understand the business, uh, and now we're getting to have a little broader view of it. And you're part of that broader view, so um, tell us about your. Tell us about yourself first, and then we'll move to your company because you actually have some interesting background before you even found your way to the warehouse theater. Sure. Um, uh, I grew up in New England. Um, uh, my first job uh, in a professional theater, I was an uh, I was an intern at Trinity Rep in Providence, uh, Rhode Island, for a couple of years. I was lucky enough to be there when uh, Oscar Eustace was uh, the artistic director in the '90s. Um, uh, discovered a, a love of dramaturgy, did not know that that form of new play dramaturgy had existed uh, before working, um, before like week one of being a literary intern at Trinity. Um, uh, worked there for a couple of years, had a couple of different internships and a bunch of different odd jobs that I did throughout the company, including stage manage and worked in the box office and worked backstage. Uh, but really, uh, in my heart was a dramaturg. Um, stuck around in Providence, moved to New York, uh, worked freelance in New York for a few years. Uh, then left New York to uh, be a dramaturg at Center Theater Group in Los Angeles, the Amundsen, Mark Taper and Kirk Douglas Theaters. Was dramaturg there for about seven years, uh, found and developed some really great things. Um, uh, uh, sort of most, um, uh, the one that I had the most involvement with was uh, from uh, Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. I was the dramaturg uh, from first draft through Broadway, um, uh, uh, but a handful of other things as well. Uh, worked in uh, worked at the taper for. Uh, about seven years, um, and then decided if I was in Los Angeles, I should work uh, in film and TV and try and make money for once in my life. Um, maybe money. Uh, oh, that. Oh, that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, uh, uh, a good friend of mine from Providence, uh, a relatively <laughs> well-known actor by the name of John Krasinski, had been trying to get me to start a, a production company with him. Uh, for like the previous 10 years. Um, but after seven years of working in uh, regional theater, I was like, sure, I'll do film and TV for a bit. Uh, produced a couple of uh, movies with John, uh, some television shows as well. Um, found that uh, although I loved making money, I did not like the film and TV uh, industry as much as I missed the nonprofit theater industry. Uh, and was lucky enough to. That, that, I have to stop you there. <laughs> you don't hear that a lot. I miss the not for profit theater industry. Um, yeah. So good for you. Um, and, yeah, and actually, your 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 background and your and your your um, interests really do inform what you do at at the, at the warehouse. And we'll we'll come to that a little, a little later. Yeah. You have given me so much I want to talk about. Right. It's going to be it's going to be very hard for me to actually focus on the warehouse, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. So you keep going because you have there's more. Well, yeah, and then I started at the where I became the producing artistic director of the warehouse uh, about uh, six years or so ago. Um, we're a small, uh, about 130 seat black box in Greenville, South Carolina, in the upstate. We're sort of close to Asheville, North Carolina, is the closest bigger city. We're in, sort of in between Charlotte and Atlanta. We're the only equity house uh, for about 300 miles. We're one of only two in South Carolina, but the other one's down by the coast. Uh, so we have a sort of like very specific niche in this town and that uh, we are both the only fully professional theater uh, uh, in the, the city, as well as the one that sort of pushes the envelope the most. Um, I was going to say that that's that's what's interesting about the warehouse. You do not pander. You do not you, you do not like like pander to your audiences and give them give them the the, the things that they know and that they're and they're familiar with. You do some really uh, challenging pieces. Uh, yes. I mean, I think it, it's based upon the fact that I've always been very interested in what is new, um, given my new play development background for the last 20 plus years. Um, I probably should actually think about how long that's been. It's definitely been more than 20 years. So I think the plus is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that statement. 
Um, but uh, to me, um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that uh, for some of the people that it was very important to be reminded of theater outside of New York, whereas most of the time what I'm doing is being like, is there such a thing as New York theater? Why do I care about New York theater? I care more about what happens in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm mostly kidding about that, but I do think that it's really important that a regional theater service its region uh, and not just do whatever they might have seen uh, on the Tony Awards or whatever is the most the hottest play. I'm more interested in having conversations with our audience and whether that's a new play by an unknown writer or uh, a regional theater staple that's been produced everywhere across the country, but maybe hasn't made it to a big production in New York. That's more interesting to me and what I'm doing. And I really like to set our set us apart from the other theaters in town. There are a ton of really great theaters um, in Greenville, which allows us to have a very specific mission and allows us to stick to that specific mission. Um, so there's a big Broadway touring house. There's a children's theater. There's a handful of other, you know, semi-professional to uh, community theaters within a big radius. So they can they can do all of the work that is less interesting to me and allows us to sort of really have, uh, you know, adult conversations about relevant contemporary shows or issues um, that are that 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 will hopefully have just as much impact. And it helps that we're a small house. You know, I don't have to fill a 2000 seat house. Well, I want to uh, I want to get into some of that, because I, 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 that's one of the things that impressed me when I went to your site and decided to look at it. It's like I haven't heard of any of these things. <laughs> how, come, how can they get I mean, the regional theaters that I've talked to so many of them have to have to program things that are familiar to their audiences in order to get their audiences. How has the Warehouse Theater, and it probably predates you, but how has the Warehouse Theater managed to uh, cultivate an interest in, in unknown works in its population? And, I think and, it, and is it anything that anybody else can do? Because a lot of people want to do this and you've done it. I think it's twofold. I think one, it is yes. I think that it, we're going into our next season uh, starting in September will be our 50th. And so I think it made uh, uh, it made a big impact early on doing doing not just whatever was the most popular play. They they really did sort of build an audience from them and get a reputation uh, in town that says like, go here for sort of more current work or more relevant work. And then I think the other thing is, is just doing it. I mean, I think that you can just program shows and then explain why the shows are good. And if the shows are good and the audience starts talking about it, then it just sort of propagates itself. Um, uh, the story that I like to tell is that that um, in one season, I programmed both uh, Larissa Fast Horse's The Thanksgiving Play and um, Glass Menagerie, uh, starring a really incredible local actor that everyone knows and loves and did a fantastic job as Amanda. Uh, the Thanksgiving Play outsold uh, Glass Menagerie, which is good because I actually don't like Glass Menagerie as a play. I think it's kind of boring and this is why people always invite me on to things that are being recorded and I say things like, I find the Glass Menagerie boring and then I'll never work again. I love the Glass Menagerie. <laughs> sure, it's great. I, I'm, I love that you love it. Uh, if I have to... And I love, uh, that you, I love that you don't actually. <laughs> It's just, it's one of those things where it's like, do we really need this again? Um, uh, is, that's, there, is, there, that's is, more is there a to, desire for is, the 75th production of the that Glass Menagerie? That is more Menagerie. to the and point. Are. You know, it's like um, Glass Menagerie. It's also like in musicals. It's do we need another gypsy? It's it, There's there's yeah. so many th things that get done repeatedly, repeatedly. And they become stunts, basically, to sort of bring in stars uh, is what, what often happens. I mean, the last... The last star glass menagerie was Sally Fields, I think. And I, I, yeah. There might have been one since then. Um, so I, I think everybody, in the, the community that you're with today is all completely with you. I mean, I'm sure that they're all just like cheering. They're all cheering. Um, I'm going to not get to this now, but at, at some point, let's talk about whether whether you're open to receiving um, new plays uh, sure. by, by, by writers. But um, t tell us how... How do you select, how do you program your plays? Um, you've given us a lot of clues because we know that you have a dramaturg uh, heart. Your heart and soul is, is in dramaturgy. So, so there is a, you, have, you bring an eye to it that, that is a little different than a lot of artistic directors at other regional theaters. Um, can you talk about it a little bit? Sure. I think the useful thing is that, you know, I learned a lot from Oscar and certainly uh, also from early on, uh, 
of of when I'm reading a play and when I'm working on a new play, my aim is to be generic audience member uh, that comes in to read this. And if generic audience member loves the play, then I assume uh, that like the audience, that my generic audience members that are not generic and that I have a little bit more specific in, uh, uh, knowledge of will also like the play. And so for me, you know, for, for being an artistic director, it was finally being able to pull upon the decades of experience of reading 500 plays a year of knowing a bunch of new playwrights that were working on work that was really exciting and interesting to me and then trying to find that sort of like the middle ground of the plays that again those regional theater staples uh when i think of something like native gardens um uh, like a play uh, when i came to greenville the first thing i asked is like what are the top three things the community is always talking about recently and the first thing was gentrification and so it was like great okay i'll look for plays about gentrification um uh and then i could just pull from my rolodex or also ask playwrights like do you happen to be working on anything that involves gentrification um uh so i think that it was it was coming from from that aspect but it also is when I'm planning a season, I'm trying to do like a 45 million things at once. I'm trying to appeal to the widest variety of audience members as possible. I'm trying to show the widest point of views as possible. I would love the 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 cast makeups that we have on our stage to replicate what we have in our audience. So I'm trying to sort of just like continually produce works that show a wide diverse of age, race, gender, sexual identity, all of that to sort of tell people that there is a home for them here. So, um, so in, in, in other words, Mike, you're doing what every artistic director should be doing. Yes, yes. I mean, I think there is a sense of, of you won't get a new audience if you don't show that audience there's a place for them on the stage or backstage or that the stories matter to them um or why the story should matter to them um so I'm, I'm looking for that stuff i'm also just like trying to balance you know if i'm going to do um if i'm going to do native gardens what's the other because that play requires a significant amount of set and like and 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 realism is there another show that has less realism that i can show a wide variety of types of productions let me ask you a very basic question how big is your stage well, we are, we literally are a black box. So uh, we redo the seating for every show. Um, so the stage, it is basically a 50 by 50 square. Um, so it, it it changes for every show, uh, but we have the ability to go wide, to go big, to go thrust, to go tennis court, to go in the round, proscenium, weird proscenium. Um, uh, somewhat immersive we've done a few times too. And the whole thing for me when I'm doing that too, when I'm programming is that I want, it's been a little bit different because of COVID and costs, but my main aim is every time you walk into the space, you have to stop and it forces you to reacquaint your pre-existing notion of what the theater is. So at the very least you're coming in and being like, oh, I haven't seen something this way or, oh, the last time I came, I was facing the other way just to force you to sort of, to not just go through the motions and, and, be, a, a, and be sort of like a lemming audience member. It forces you to engage with the work each time because we are forcing you to fix perspective differently each time. Interesting. Um, can we can we go a little bit back into the history of of, of the warehouse? Because uh, and I also want to ask you specifically as you as you take us through, um, did anything change, or do you feel that you've helped make anything change when you came on board? Um, is anything different, or did, were you just um, other than I don't know other if than bringing different? Your, your own personal taste, of course, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's, that's the main thing is that like I put a real, uh, I put a real focus on newer work or contemporary work. I shouldn't even say newer work, but 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 I do, I do want to program one world premiere each year, um, which we've been, which have been pretty successful for us, both in terms of like what they've done in the community and where at least one of them has gone on. The first world premiere I did was a play called Power of Sale, uh, written by Paul Grelong. Um, uh, 
about the rise of white nationalists um, on college campuses and the free speech versus hate speech debate. And we did this in 20, uh, I guess, 18 or 19. Uh, 18 is when I programmed it, but we produced it in 2019. Uh, and it just got done, uh, oh, I, I guess, about a year ago at this point uh, at the Geffen Playhouse in L.A. with Brian Cranston in the lead. And so since, when since you do I, a new since play. I you, since I know you have a relationship with the Geffen, did you help? Um, that 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 negotiation to get it to get it there. Were you involved? Um, ish. Uh, I've known Matt, uh, the, uh, who used to be the artistic director there from from my from my time in L.A. Uh, when he was running the Black Dahlia and was a director, and we'd worked together on a handful of projects. Um, uh, but when uh, I had gotten the script to uh, uh, Cranston, um, and then he had approached the Geffen, and luckily Matt knew me and knew Paul, and so because I had also pitched him, so, Pat so it, it didn't. In other words, it didn't hurt. It didn't hurt. It was very clear. Like it was very easy for Matt to be like, I know that play. I know those people. Yeah. Like, let's talk about this. So it was an easy, it was an easier sell. I so mean, the, it's an easy sell if Brian Cranston says he wants to do anything. But so the, yeah. the, big, the, the bigger point there is that it sounds like you, well, this might not have been, this might have been a one, a one time only, but I have a feeling that you're the kind of guy that helps to uh, plays to find further life beyond uh, when you do them. That's the hope. I mean, I I know how difficult it is. The, one of the joys about my position in my theater is I don't have to just do world premieres. I can do second productions of shows. I don't care if I do the world premiere. I don't have to do that because I know how difficult it is for playwrights to get second productions that get first productions and not with stars in, in different locations. And so, it cheers, sounds out in the entire room. <laughs> If you if you yeah. if you could hear them all just screaming yes we because we've talked about this we've talked about yeah. about the 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 world premieritis um, we I mean I've had uh, national uh, play network national new play network on and we've talked about it there too have you ever been in a part of a, a, a rolling world premiere. No, I haven't. I think because of my time at CTG and we were doing, we didn't care if we were doing world premieres or second or, or second productions. We cared deeply about doing world premieres and we did some great ones while I was there. And I'm really proud of those. But it like that was the good thing about Michael. Uh, one of the many good things about Michael Ritchie was that he was like, I don't care. We don't have to do world premieres. And I think that was super helpful for me to have someone that had said, like, it doesn't matter if this is the first one. And you, so you, you, um, there, you have just made 35 people very happy happy well 36 <laughs> including me <laughs> great i mean I th yeah, but i think that's so that's the thing is that like i yes my my aim is always to try and get uh, uh uh other productions it's helpful for us as the warehouse to get our name out but it also is the three world premieres i've done so far have been by three dear friends that i've known for forever and i want to support and cheer their work because that's what a dramaturg does they're not just there for sort of the the immediate glory of one production they're there to make the show as good as possible so it can be done as many times in as many locations as possible so i'm going to push you back to the to the history of, of the warehouse because where did the, sure. where did the where did the theater come how, how did the how did the warehouse come to become a theater why did that happen it was started by Furman University graduates, actually, uh, a university that's uh, that's super close to us in Greenville, uh, um, and sort of f f it was formed as that sort of alternative theater. Um, you know, there's a lot of again, there there were other community theaters and other and other entertainment options in town, but they wanted a place to be doing more adult work, um, and certainly throughout the years. Again, they've done it. It's one of the reasons why when I applied for the job, I was excited because they had done like. Very recently, they had done like Angels in America in August Osage County and 4,000 Miles. Um, and they were doing that season, they were doing a Nick Jones play, Important Hats of the 20th Century, as well as a uh, vibrator play. And I was like, great, if you guys are already doing this work, I don't have to lay more groundwork. I can just continue moving us down this path and every now and then sprinkle in something brand new or something newer. Um, and then that's exciting that, that, that the audience will, it's, it's a logical next step for where our theater was. Okay, um, so, and th th that's, what is it? 50, it's now 50 years, 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, coming up on 50. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up on 50 now. Um, so moving ahead, flash fast forward to uh, when you came on board, uh, a couple questions that, that occurred to me. First of all, how did you get to know the community and did you come in with, 
with assumptions that had to be overturned or and how did you learn about the community you were serving I came in and, you know, because of my dramaturgy background, again, I mean, I was used to sort of being in rooms with writers, directors, actors, and sort of communicating between people, uh, institutions and artists. And so the main thing that I did when I came in was, and they did a great job actually with my interview process, including uh, a one lunch with sort of like, I think it was 10 maybe of the like artists that had been with the theater for the last 15 years or so. Um, so I had some knowledge, but I did just sort of try, I sat down with everyone that I could and talked to everybody that I could, including other arts leaders, um, other people in the community. I basically did like a, a, a listening tour. Uh, uh, I I think we, I think I, I ended up doing a bunch of curtain speeches and then showing up early and like meeting donors and meeting artists and meeting just supporters from the warehouse and talking to them. And I don't think there was any sort of preconceived notion that I had, um, uh, mostly because, you know, some of, so much of my work when I was working at CTG uh, was, it, it, or even the film work that I did was not located in New York or LA. So I developed things in Denver. I developed things in Kansas City. I developed things in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, in Portland, Oregon, in, you know, and also I grew, grew up in New England and uh, I um, so I had enough sort of like lo locations that I had spent time in to know to not have any preconceived notions. Um, it was very clear for me early on that I did sort of say like, what are the things that are going to get me into trouble? And I think they, uh, but even even that, the, the, I the only assumption I made, which is the uh, 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 was wasn't even really an assumption, but I think I programmed something that they're like, there's a lot of cursing in this. And I was like, what the fuck do you mean? Uh, and they were like, well, there's just a lot of cursing. And I was like, I don't understand what the shit is this. And I was like, oh, see, I don't hear that. So I think that's the problem. Uh, also, my apologies. I didn't even ask if I could curse on this. But absolutely uh, fine. It's fine. The internet, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, but I think so that was the that was one of those things of like, right, yes, okay, sure. I should probably make sure that I'm uh, not cursing all the time in front of uh, everybody. But I had to deal with that in, in, in L.A., uh, with donors and supporters as well. So not a lot of preconceived notions. I try not to. I think it, it's 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 foolish to do that. Um, uh, you know, I well, actually, one preconceived notion I had was sort of like how we tried to diversify our audience, our, our, our acting pool. And I was like, we just need to jump off the deep end and do shows like Sweat right away without sort of building enough infrastructure. And, and again, letting people know that we are the kind of theater that produces work, not just by uh, dead white writers. Um, so there was sort of like some learning curve about how to make sure that I was bringing in enough diversity across the board for uh for creative teams and artists on stage that's very 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 interesting and um very smart um I, remind me what year did you did you come on board is it 2018 uh, no it was six years six years ago i think i the, the the curse of being an artistic director is that right now i am also planning like 2025 so i legitimately never know what year it is um this is why i'm very grateful i don't have to write checks anymore um oh i know uh, that one too yeah because it would just be like i would just write a check for 2030 and be like well that's what i'm working on right now so it was six years ago whatever it was um uh, shorthand the thing that i can uh, i can uh, I, I interviewed uh two days after Trump was elected president. So okay. that that gives you the the that's the that's the only way I can sort of figure out what year it was. <laughs> um well well maybe we'll we won't jump into that too much but no we um, can veer we can veer away from that. No, no, I don't I don't normally veer but um I have other things that I that I was thinking about asking you. Um sure. so has there been any kind of evolution or change in your approach to things and your understanding of your community the longer that you've been there. Um, I know that you didn't start with preconceptions. However, has, have things evolved? And then we're going to probably take it up to, to 2020 when, when we hit uh, sure. shutdown. I think the evolution, yes, actually that glass menagerie is a good evolution of one of the things that I said uh, when we were talking about producing it, I was like, if I walk in and I see a hyper-realistic uh, 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 living room, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to want to kill myself. I was like, I don't, I don't want this to be like every other production you've seen. So I want to figure out ways in which we can sort of like 
just change again change the audience pers perspective of what they're what they're coming into and i really loved our production of it it was this is going to sound terrible but it was it found as much of the humor in the show as the, as we could find uh but what i didn't fully understand was that like i i walked out on opening night and it felt like a funeral before the show uh and everyone was just sitting in there very quiet no one saying anything and it felt like a weird church and it became apparent that they were treating this as a as a reverential piece of like of classic text and they should not it was it was they didn't give themselves permission to laugh or enjoy it because I felt like they felt it was like this was them having to eat vegetables basically um like just just blanched vegetables with no ranch dressing or salt on it yeah, blanched vegetables that would be streetcar yeah <laughs> yeah that was a good one i uh i i <laughs> i'll give you that um uh but they they just they 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 came at it from a different and i was like oh no 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 um so that sort of did help me sort of understand if I'm going to program a classic play that I want to bring something new to, I have to be prepared for the audience that might not want to go along with it, or an audience that might have to work harder to get them to sort of like understand what this version of this story was saying, as opposed to, you know, the billion times they've seen it before. Um, and I'm not talking about like, we said it in space or something stupid like that. It was just sort of like, just giving them permission and under understanding that like it might be different than their dusty memories would be. I saw a streetcar named Desire directed by Eva Vahove in which Blanche was in the ba bathtub from beginning to throughout the entire play. The, uh, so, the one where um, uh, he spit V8 on her or is that? I think so. No, that was Hedda. That was his Hedda Gabler, I think. I was just not a happy theater goer at that. <laughs> Um, that's, I but think that's it was his head of gabbler in New York Theater Workshop that I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Uh, so. Oh, really? Okay. I wasn't a big fan of Evo. Um, so uh, I guess I can say that. He doesn't know me. He doesn't care. Um, so uh, let's let's move to the, um, to the pivot, uh, if there was sure. a pivot. How did you deal with COVID? Um, and when you think about it you you had only been there what three years when COVID yeah, hit? yeah it's about three yeah um uh we dealt with well we we i felt very lucky in that we entered the pandemic with the most amount of cash reserves that we had had in a while so financially we were on a real streak which was helpful um and uh we did have to cancel we we you know we postponed and then we before we realized we had to cancel it was very confusing and it was also hard for me because most of my friends still live in new york or los angeles so i was dealing with everything sort of like a couple weeks before it, the 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 true panic hit everybody in like greenville so from we were just we would just started um a run of hedwig and the angry inch and i was convinced we weren't going to get to open Opening, but we got through two of the four weekends we were pr producing it so it was sort of a white knuckle ride for the for the first few weeks waiting for that other shoe to drop I'm great with mixed metaphors um but I think that um so what I wanted to do um actually because I started, I, I spent a lot of time in those first weeks watching the sort of archival videos that some theaters were letting uh people watch and I felt like both very happy and like profoundly uncomfortable at seeing like rehearsal or like first preview things that people never thought the, the public were going to see. Um, but I still loved being able to, to see other people's work that I wouldn't normally be able to see. Um, but I did want to explore ways in which because of my film and TV background, I, I did not want to record what we were doing. I was like, we can't do it in a way that's going to make sense. It's going to look cheap. It's going to look bad. I don't want to do it. We don't have the like $10 million that the National Theater gets from the British government to like really record something professionally that makes it look as good as a movie. Um, uh, also, there are literally an endless amount of hyper-realistic, very well shot uh, uh, pieces of entertainment available if you have uh, uh, TV or internet access. So what can we do that will set us apart? 
Um, and I had talked to two friends that I had from LA that did sort of like that, that do escape rooms uh, and interactive theater experiences. And they, I asked them to pitch me a bunch of ideas that we could do that would be, that would work virtually. And the first one they came up with was an improvised Zoom seminar uh, where everyone would come to the Zoom seminar with an item that they had had in their house that they hadn't touched in the last three months. Um, and then they were going to be led on a seminar by like a Marie Kondo-esque person um, who's trying to get rid of, to get them to declutter their house. Um, and as the seminar goes on, uh, you realize there's a plant in the audience. Um, he also has a piano and it becomes a musical in which that plant starts singing about people's objects that they've talked about uh before so it becomes a battle between the Marie Kondo and the musician uh over sort of like if people should get rid of their stuff or not get rid of their stuff Did this um, have that a was title? Called, uh, objectivity objectivity okay said. good okay. yeah um, and it was a big success for us. And like you said at the beginning, it was really incredible because we got people from, we got so many people from Australia that came to see shows uh, virtually at the Warehouse Theater. And it really expanded our audience in an incredible way. Um, uh, but what we found out was that we weren't pulling in a lot of local people. Um, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So we kept doing digital things because we had no choice. We couldn't. Well, do you think do you think it's because your local people know that the theater and had expectations and you weren't doing what they were expecting? Yes and no. I think that we'll, because what I ended up doing was I did a, a solo show that was like a monologue that was a 45 minute long Zoom monologue uh, uh, called Fire in the Garden. That was a that would have been a, a, something we would have produced on the main stage, but we just made it as uh, as a father recording a video to his son, which is what the show is about, um, except it's play. But we just made it a, 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 a one shot take on an iPhone. Um, uh, and so we did other things. We did short pieces by really incredible writers. I commissioned playwrights to write for specific, uh, I commissioned national playwrights to write for local artists. So I did enough of other work that was more tailor made specifically to our community, but they still weren't coming out as much as we wanted to. I think there was just, it was also like by this point, remember this is South Carolina. So by this point, um, basically by June of 2020, the pandemic was over in South Carolina. Um, uh, uh, it, uh, <laughs> June um, of 2020, oh my God. Yeah, like we were back open for, not we, the warehouse, but like South Carolina for the most part was open for business uh, very <laughs> soon after March uh, of 2020. Um, so I think they were just sort of like, we don't want to see anything else on Zoom or anything on the computer or on the TV on the computer. We want to come in. Uh, so we, we used those four projects that we, uh, uh, three or four projects to sort of bridge us until, uh, we could, we could reopen our production of Hedwig that we closed early, uh, at the, uh, basically like in 2021 in September. So we, we just closed Hedwig, kept the set there and then reopened it in September of 2021. That brings me to another question, because um, I'm surprised when you said Hedwig. So, so you you have limited capability to do musicals, but you do do musicals. We do, um, yes. Um, uh, we uh, my taste sent, tends to run in the sort of more uh, uh, the the less capital M capital T musical theater shows, um, but we still do some of them. We're going to do a a pretty large one for our 50th, which has not been announced yet. But uh, we did like, I uh, I programmed and produced um, uh, Spelling Bee last summer because that's a show that I truly love um, and was, is fits what the kind of work that we do. And also um, if, it's the, if it's the space. Yes. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't so need need more than what the, what's there, really. Yeah, it's twofold of trying to find that that uh trying to find the shows that fit our audience and fit our space. So, you know, again, like we did the immersive bloody, we did an immersive bloody bloody Andrew Jackson, basically set in a, a giant bar. Uh we've done a headwig, we've done spelling bee. Um uh we were supposed to do the Bengsons musical 100 days but our director uh uh is also the associate director on here lies love on broadway and they now overlap so we had to pull that from our uh, 49th season um uh but yeah it is 
uh, when we do musicals, because they're so astronomically expensive and difficult in our space, we have to really sort of like, and also every other theater mostly does musicals in our town. So we sort of like carve out our niche with straight plays as much as possible. So next, next up would be, how did you, um, how did you adapt to, how did your audiences adapt to coming back to live performance? And was that was that a slow process? I mean, we're still dealing with it here in New York. Although, if you go if you went to the Music Man, you wouldn't know that there was a pandemic. But um, right. uh, other shows are, right. are suffering. Um, and I don't yeah. think you have I don't think you have Hugh Jackman in your in your repertory. Uh, no, I I asked, but he politely declined to come. Foolish uh, move! Foolish move on his part. It was. I was like, well, you're going to do. I mean, you can keep doing the Music Man, or you can yeah, come really. do um, do real theater. Some other show. Yeah, I can't think of a funnier show to cast Hugh Jackman in. Um, but, you know, it was hard because uh, when we started in September uh, of 2021, uh, we had we had, we were the <laughs> uh, I think the only business uh, within uh, uh, 200 miles, maybe or so that we did require uh, masks and vaccines. Um, so uh, we lost a chunk of audience because of our mask and vaccine mandate. Um uh, which we ran that for about, I think it was about five or six months um, uh, before we loosened the vaccine mandate, uh, but still required masks. And then that some people trickled back because we had loosened the vaccine mandate. And then once we lost the mask mandate, we got more people that came back. So now masks are optional for this season. Uh, 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 they're ma optional now. And I would say uh, maybe two people per performance wear them uh, uh, when I do a curtain speech uh, here. Now, uh, Candy Carl is asking, uh, how did you deal with the equity mask and COVID vax rules? And did, did you, I mean, you, you, you are an equity house. You're the only one within 300 miles. Yeah. Um, we, um, we, who, uh, I don't have enough time or this is being recorded um, to uh, talk about, I think, uh, my 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 feelings about some of the some of the equity guidelines and and how they rolled those out for smaller theaters. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything about that. But what I will say, well, you, we, well, you we just followed, you just said a, you just said a lot about that. So, so yeah, um, we followed all of the we 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 are still we followed and are still following all of those guidelines. We it's you know it's been crazy expensive. Uh uh you know uh, even when the numbers are down it's still crazy expensive because when you only have we only have four performances a week and so when you have to test people three times a week it becomes uh uh and when before you could get the rapid tests we were testing PCRs but we were testing before we would actually know if the tests were coming back and so th there there were a lot of things that were not tailor made for different communities. Equity has been better about that now um, and allowing theaters some leniency in how they are dealing with their uh, testing policies. But we 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 followed it to a T and it, you know, it was I um, I'm I'm it, it feels like dumb to uh, because uh, uh, it feels dumb to say this or to be proud of this because I understand that it is sort of like uh, running through raindrops, uh, but we did not have to cancel any performances because of any COVID outbreaks um, uh, uh, so far, he says, knocking on wood. Um, Good idea. And I don't think that's, I mean, I think we follow all of the things we can. We had also just uh, upgraded our HVAC system right before the pandemic. That, that was my next question. Yep. Oh, so, so before the pandemic, you had done it. Yep. Oh, that was That was lucky. That was very yes. lucky. Yep, and then we were able to get some uh, federal funding to 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 make some of our to make our bathrooms a little bit more like air, airflow come in, uh, and to renovate those and make them gender neutral and just we did a lot of things that we we, we got lucky in that a lot of the building upgrades uh, like helped with all of this and we also followed these mandates um uh that 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 were very helpful i mean again we still we just had a uh, um a production team member test positive 2 weeks ago so like you said it's not over uh and we just we lost them for uh they just came back they're just back tonight and so it's it was 10 days that they were out uh and when you only have 3 day, 3 weeks of rehearsal it makes it uh for a difficult time because we cannot afford to have understudies for both the financial reason and also the where are they going to go um uh, if one person gets sick we all 
all get sick. Uh, so we've operated under the, if someone gets sick, we'll cancel shows. Um, it's been helpful that we haven't, you know, this season was built for this. I programmed shows that I was not trying to burn doing, you know, if, if Hugh Jackman wanted to come do music, man, I would say, Hey, Hugh, like, hold on a second. Um, with the pandemic, I don't know if everyone's going to come back. So I'm going to say no to you because that's a good sound financial decision. Um, uh, but so I didn't program anything this season that I thought was going to, no, and I wish, I wish I had been there for that conversation. He took it well. Oh, okay. I think he understood. Uh, he, right. he was proud. Um, plus, he also knew that Russell Crowe was the next call that I made, and Russell was like, I'm in. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Happy ending. Um, so, um, RK Green um, has, a kind of, has a question. Let me, let me put it to you in, in another way. You, you, you know what enhancement deals are, right? Yes. Um, is your theater comp is your theater a company that would be a place that a producer might want to consider doing an enhancement deal with um probably not i i, I say that only because we are so small that i feel like the, the that um uh i mean again if someone is interested and excited and it's a project that i love i would be definitely open to it um but i think that it is like what i basically do it's it's hard enough for us to do world premieres that are straight plays and one of the things that i tell the playwrights that we work on of like there's not a ton of time um and you know i have an incredible uh uh roster of performers local and regional and and some from new york that will pull in and and other locations that will pull in but what we're basically going to do, if it helps you to think about this, is we're going to give you a really impressive workshop. We're going to fully produce it. It's going to be a fully produced production. But for your head, if you want to treat this as a workshop where you get to hear your work as is on the page without me trying to meddle too much, um, uh, we can do that. And then when it's done, I can send you a series of notes of sort of like, here are the things that I think I heard both in rehearsals and with three weeks of seeing it with our audiences. And you can take these notes or you can throw these notes out. Again, I'm a dramaturg. I'm used to this. And, and, and actually, that was the real answer to, to, uh, to RK's real question. So I, th I, think, you, I think you addressed oh. exactly what he was wondering about. What he said was, okay. will, will you work with producers developing new plays and musicals? And you've just offered uh, an, a situation in which you would actually be helping with the development of a new work. Yes, I think that we. Of course, we, it would have to be in the season in 2026 at this point. Because 20, <laughs> 2050. No, but I think that the, yes, I think there is. Uh, I'm always interested and intrigued by that, uh, by, by, by again, launching new work and also having people that help pay for it. Um, because again, for us, it's like we, we were operating on such shoestring budgets to yeah. begin with that any money that comes to us is super helpful and grateful. Well, I'm, because I'm, I'm actually amazed that you, that you can, you've managed to find a way to afford doing musicals, uh, with a, a, a Talk to me, size. uh, in a year and a half, uh, <laughs> Whether you can whether you can sustain that, yeah. Well, it's it's well it's that where we can say, but like next year, I'm only going to do five shows instead of six. And one of the reasons was is because the musical is going to be so expensive that I'm like, well, let's let. And also, it just it's the theater business is so stupid about sort of like let's throw a bunch of money, build a new world, tear it down, and then hope that people show up for the next thing. Um, so I think that it's one of those situations of like, it's it's definitely pick and choose. And I'm doing a bigger musical to the next couple of years. If we do musicals, it'll be back to the sort of two-handers with a small, with like more of a, you know, again, that we're looking at like the headwigs of like, we only need a four piece band for this uh, as opposed to a full orchestra. Okay, so so there is there is a certain reality check that has the things I have to go through in order to to realistically be done in your space. Which, yes, which is yeah. what I would I would have assumed. Although I have to give you credit because he's you you're very ambitious in terms of what you do with with your limited resources. It's it's impressive, very impressive. Thank you. I um, didn't have any gray hair before I started this <laughs> this call. This call now you, now specific, you've, now you've told specifically me. this. Yeah, this um, is this has made me panic. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Randall Huskinson. I've heard several mention. Oh, actually, uh, Owen, do it. Do your thing. Do your thing. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Randall Huskinson asks, I've heard several mentions of commissions. While every playwright dreams of that, many of us are earlier in our careers or simply not that connected, nor agent represented. How do you approach working with new to you playwrights? 
That is a hard question. When I came here, uh, my I did a thing that I thought was really smart in that I uh, I re reached out to like every playwright I knew and like the Playwrights Union in LA. And I was like, send me your work. Uh, and then I got about 6,000 plays and I've read maybe four of them. Um, I, ve I vastly overestimated how much free time I was going to have to read uh, with the day-to-day -day of running a theater of my size. Um, so getting to know new playwrights is catch as catch can. Um, uh, for the commissions that we did, it was like, I basically went to a bunch of friends because I was like, Hey, do me a favor. Um, uh, the commission that we have that we're, that we're hopefully going to produce it was a local playwright, a Furman University student who wrote a play that was produced in undergrad. And I really loved her work and her voice. And I wanted to support her. Um, uh, so she lucked out that she was local. Um, so but it is it is a, a, a question that I have been really grappling with of like during the pandemic, I got to read a lot more. But now that we're back to producing in person and everything is exponentially more hard than it was pre pandemic, the time for reading is harder. I also have a four month old, um, which has slightly who, who you were down. who you were playing with before you came on. Yes, uh, who uh, um, I needed to I needed to get some FaceTime with before I had this FaceTime. Um, so, um, you know, so a lot of my free time has been sucked up. So it is I mean, I think for me, it has been like what I've what I've doubled down to is trying to find local like collegiate playwrights um uh, that i that i could have a relationship with here that understand what greenville is and know people in the community uh has been my new has been my newer focus and balancing that with we just had a sofia alvarez world premiere obviously sofia is like a really great playwright and screenwriter but because i've known her for you know 15 years or so i during the pandemic i was like why don't you send me whatever it is you're working on and it just happened to be a play that i loved and so i think she was a little surprised when i was like i just want to Produce this like you don't have, we just we'll just let me do it um and um so that locked out that way of how so that's how most of the world premieres have gone where i have talked to a playwright about like remember that play from 10 years ago that you never got produced what if we produced it so i'm a unique situation in that way do, me, do me a favor I'm, I'm just just so everybody can hear can you can you can you name the the plays that are in your current season just so people hear the the depth, the, the 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 range of them. Yes, this is this is great because uh, I have to remember which season we're again. Uh, we began the season with Pipeline uh, by Dominique Morisot. We then uh, did Witch by Jen Silverman. Uh, the next one was Kill Corp. That's Sofia Alvarez world premiere. Um, we are in rehearsals for The Legend of Georgia McBride by Matthew Lopez. Uh, the next show is uh, uh, Harry Clark. Uh, the David uh, Kale one person show. And then we were going to do uh, 100 Days by the Bengsons and Sarah Gancher, but because we had to replace that, we, we are now replacing that with God of Carnage. So that's a play that everybody knows, but oh. I had to sort of punt to something that was local, cheap, and something that was basically in my roster of things that I could pull off in three months as opposed to having a year of planning like I normally would. But if I'm not mistaken, God of Carnage is the only one that's this played in New York. Uh, of, of every, everything. Uh, uh, um, uh, Harry Clark did. Um, did. Yeah, the Vineyard. Uh, it was the, uh, uh, Billy Crudup did it at the the Vineyard, Lisa. Oh, 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 okay, okay. Um, keep going now and we got, got a lot of questions. We sure do. And, and he's got to get back, to, he's got to get back to his four-year-old. Uh, All right, month, uh, then I'll, I'll try month. picking up the pace a little bit. Uh, month, Donald month, month. Month. asks, <laughs> what percent of your audience are subscribers and what are the demographics of your audience? And finally, has the current political environment influenced your selection process? <laughs> Uh, I was just talking about this earlier in that, um, you know, a Rocky Horror Picture Show and ha uh, has been like the number one moneymaker for the warehouse in the last 15 years or so. Uh, and that's why I did Hedwig, because I was like, well, if you like Rocky Horror, you're going to love Hedwig. Um, and that sold really well for us. Then I was like, great, brilliant. We're going to do Legend of Georgia McBride. This is before Southern States decided to start uh, making drag illegal. Um, so that's a fun thing that we're now dealing with. Uh, we have not, uh, the, the South Carolina bills haven't come out of committee yet. So it hasn't necessarily changed what I'm going to do, but it has, uh, sort of, uh, made the shows more relevant, uh, in a way that I find, uh, uh, 
um, both infuriating and uh, lovely uh, at the same time. Well, like, well, at least people are talking about us, but I hate why they're talking about us. Um, a percentage of subscribers, we have a we have a pretty healthy subscriber base, but we do a lot of single tickets. I think because this year, especially because of both the pandemic and the nature of the work that is not, not a lot of people know the shows. I think they're sort of waiting a little bit more, but we have a, a really solid, incredible group of supporters that are like, I don't care, I'm just gonna show up. And my whole thing to them always is that like, I don't expect you to like everything because that's insane. Um, I picked all of them and I might not even like all of them. Um, uh, so yeah, so I think that it, 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 it goes hand in hand. Um, and I for, there was the third part to that question that I think I missed. Oh, and we'll still part. Um, uh, well, you did actually. The no, I think the yeah, I think you answered all three parts pretty oh, well. Okay, great. Percentage of audience or subscribers, demographics. Oh, demographics. Or... We 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 have a younger audience. I think we have a we uh, uh, than some of the other theaters in town. Our audience is younger. It's still a theater audience, so it's not like we're uh, 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 only producing the Gen Xers. A uh, Gen Xers, <laughs> Zers. Uh, I don't know the alphabet very well, um, but we do have a we on average we have a much we have a younger audience. I would say than the other theaters in town. Yeah, I miss I miss the COVID letters. I I was getting to to understand the the Greek alphabet a lot better, and then they stopped those. I, I bring back bring back the Greek letters. That's what I say. Um, what there's a, there's another at least two more questions I can see. Yep, question from Maureen Condon. Do you have a rear screen projector for scenery to save money? Uh, we do not. Um, I um. Um, this is another one of those things about my film and TV background. Uh, um, for the most part, um, I hate projections because they never look as good as I think they I want them to in our space with our budget. We did one show that was we transferred uh, a Lauren Gunderson premiere uh, from Merrimack Rep um, uh, in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, close to my hometown, uh, to us and. Uh, when we were talking about how they did their projections and we just don't have the money to do that. So for me, again, it's one of those things of like, I would rather save money by having no set uh, than doing something like with technology that ends up just feeling like we're not pulling it off as well as we want to. Uh, so this year I doubled down on sort of flexibility and non-hyper-realism uh, and that kind of things. It's also, it ends up being tricky with how much space we have with both the stage and the audience risers. Um, it, it's been, it's tricky for us to rear project to get enough throw, even with short throw projectors. Um, you, you uh, now to Donald's question, you, you already said earlier that you were, you generally have 140 seats. You're in a flexible sp space. Are you are you ever in a situation where you have to take out seats because you because you of the configuration of the stage? Yes, and I would say it's probably 120 is the sort of max that we usually go oh, to. 120. Uh, it's more around 100. Um, um, yes, we have done a couple in which we have both figured that that we didn't think the show might sell as well, uh, but we wanted to make it a more intimate. Uh, setting so we we have removed uh, and made it a smaller house. I mean the the best example for that is we did um, uh, every brilliant thing the solo show which is actually works better with an audience of about like fifty. So we we did that for uh, like three weekends in which we just made the space super small in order to make it even more intimate than it already is. Um, so uh, hundred hundred to hundred. How many performances are usually in your in the run of any play? Uh, usually it's three to four weeks, depending upon the show. And so it's, uh, so it's either 12 or 16. And do you mind my asking what, what is your average capacity that you, that you play to? Um, that is a question that I actually don't know the answer to off the top of my head. My, uh, uh, it, de it depends upon the show. Um, uh, you know, like both, let's put it this way, both which and, um, uh, Witch and Kill Corp uh, had a hundred people there usually per night. Uh, Pipeline had a lot less, um, and Georgia McBride is selling well right now. So it it truly depends. You know, pre pandemic we were you know the smallest houses we were having for shows that were doing well were about like. 60 to uh, uh, 70 on Thursdays of like the, the first Thursday where word of mouth hadn't spread, but usually for the weekends we were, we were doing a hundred and 120. So what is, to what percentage of your budget uh, is made from ticket sales and what other sources of, of support do you get? 
we do a um it's about 40 60 ticket sales um uh, uh although a lot of that a lot of that has been skewed in the last 4 years because of federal funding we got ppp funding and svog funding right. um and so that sort of like and we had no ticket sales obviously so um it is that is an ever evolving conversation that like in, my, in obviously in my heart of hearts i would love for us to have like 95% of our budget be covered by um, donations so that we could lower ticket prices and just uh, uh, make it more accessible to everybody while at the same time sort of like building up an audience. But I live in a fantasy world that uh, um, uh, will not happen. <laughs> I'll, I'll join you there. I'm fine with that. Um, what what uh, What is your average ticket price? Um, our top ticket, our tickets basically are $35. Um, uh, uh, and then we do, you know, we have an I pay what I can performance, we have student previews, we have ways of of, of making that lower. Um, uh, uh, but basically, all tickets are $35. And when you budget a show, and of course, you, uh, you factor in uh, weekly running costs. So do you, do you think about that at all when you decide what you're going to book for for the season? Yeah, it, it, it's in sort of the back of my head. So for instance, we did uh, one of the, the uh, uh, like four years or so ago, we did the crucible. And I knew that show was going to so well, but also like have a billion people. Yeah. Um, so then the, the three shows after that had a max of four people. I did like one four person show and two two person shows directly after that. So I figure out a way of sort of balancing how much the human costs are going to be spread out. Um, uh, but for the most part, I try to sort of just say, like, if we're going to do this show, we're going to do this show. And I'll try and go find the funding to make sure that we're not losing too much of the, our shirts off our backs. If I think it's not going to sell, like, I, I I like having a job. So very rarely am I like, what's a 40 person musical that no one's heard of that everyone will hate that I can produce because I'd like to be fired uh, the next Great day. Ambition, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's when you went out. Yeah. Okay. Um, Arlene Romoff, who's a, an advocate for people with hearing loss, wants to know if you provide captioning, uh, do do any performances that are captioned, um, and do you have an assistive list, an assistive assistive listening. Um, system device sort. <laughs> we yeah. do have assistant listening devices. Um, we do we do not do captioning, but we do. Uh, before the pandemic, we were doing ASL interpretation. We had a we were working on a a, a program with Clemson University who teaches uh, ASL for students. We were having their students come do that. Do uh, had they did the weekend before we closed Hedwig, uh, which was like my favorite experience of seeing Hedwig uh, signed. Um, uh, but they so, have not started that program back up again. So uh, we have I'm, been. I'm going to speak for. I'm going to speak for Arlene, just because I know this is what she would tell you. Um, basically, when you do a ASL for a lot of people that have, that have hearing loss, you're you're basically doing a show in two languages that they don't speak. So uh, I think that she would like you to just consider bringing in open uh, captioning if you if you could. For like yes, it's here. always all of that is on the table. I'm willing to receive a lot of money from the government in order to help us do anything above and beyond what we're already yeah. doing. But it's, it's always on the table. <laughs> okay, um, then uh, let's see. Well, are there any others? Yep, we have a couple more. Sherry Friedman wants to know what percentage of box you pay playwrights. Zero. I don't believe playwrights you get paid. Okay. I'm just kidding. Uh, I know. I, I know. See what the response. I was wondering was how that. long you were going to hold on that. Uh, you know, uh, for world premieres, it depends. It's always a, a conversation with the agent, and then whatever DPS and Samuel French take for each individual show. We don't negotiate whatever whatever they have, uh, whatever their stipulation is. So anything between seven to ten usually is the percentage. And what um, what what equity agreement do you use with your actors? We are an SPT tier three, so a small professional theater tier three, which is basically the third smallest of the of the tiers. It's based upon house size. Okay, um, Owen, any any others? Yep, Catherine Keats wants to know what the population of Greenville is. Do audiences travel mm -hmm. in? 
They do travel in. Um, uh, Greenville is one of those weird locations and that uh, so Greenville County is like 500,000 people. However, Greenville, like the city limits is maybe like 50,000 because they did that thing where like the downtown, like one square mile of the downtown is the city limits and everything else is the county. Um, so our county basically stretches from where we are to the North Carolina border, um, which is like 45 to 50 minutes away by car on like a freeway. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty large uh, uh, county. So I don't say that like 50,000, I say 500,000. We do get a lot of people to travel and we get people to travel up from Atlanta. We get people to travel down from Charlotte, uh, some that travel, you know, uh, down from Asheville, North Carolina. But uh, um, uh, it is that helpful thing of, in fact, what was it? I can't, I can't it might have actually been it might have been appropriate. I can't remember which show it was that we did. It was either appropriate or, or Native Gardens uh, in which like a group of people came like they were just having a girls night and they wanted to because I think it was appropriate because I was like, you pick this for a girls night. This is a spectacular show uh, to see the Brandon Jacob Jenkins show. Um, uh, but they would like they split the difference between Atlanta and Charlotte and came to Greenville and like got a hotel and went out to dinner and came to see a show, um, which was I just thought was spectacular that that was their like their night out that they came to see uh, a very dark family uh, dramedy um, uh, um, about racism. Oh dear. Well, um, the, the, let's see. What else, what else is there? Uh, I think, I think we've gotten everything answered. Am I right, Owen? Yep. Uh, Gloria had a question about uh, hard of hearing listeners, but you got that when you were answering Arlene's. Okay. So, um, I've kept you here longer than I promised I would keep you. So um, that's okay. It's been a great conversation. Thank you for having me. Oh well, thank you for doing this. I I had a I had a good feeling. Is did we did this start with you friending me on link, LinkedIn? Um, uh, I believe you reached out to me. I LinkedIn is one of those hilarious things that I forget I have, and then I have like thirty people that have requested me, and I'm like everyone's in. Uh, uh, so, so what I probably happened? Weird you, thing you, of. You, your name came up with LinkedIn and said you may want to know this guy, and I and I just said well. Definitely. So I'm I'm glad I, I'm glad that I I reached out. This is it's been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it very much, and you've been you've been very open and honest and uh, generous with the information. And I think that you, other than frightening everybody to death near the end with the how much do you pay playwrights? Um, I think you. I'm glad I frightened them in that I didn't spend the entire time talking about all of the dramaturgy I had done to then be like, oh yeah, I run a small theater and I don't pay playwrights. Uh, I almost I had a was... stroke. I almost had a stroke. <laughs> well, I'm glad that it, no matter how much I talk about playwrights and how much I love them, that you would believe me when I say I don't play pay playwrights. Context clues, everybody. I'm not a very good at context clues. Great phrase. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go off for a second back into back into the lovely town of Speakerville. Speaker Wait, this was recording. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I'm gonna I'm gonna thank my my audiences as well as thanking you for being with us and thanking everybody in the room for being here today. And um, I want to thank everybody out there who's who's listening to this uh, on podcast or watching it on on YouTube. Um, like I said earlier, if you want to be part of the conversation and ask the questions, and we do have a lot of people asking questions, and we have a very active and engaged community, and I'd love you to be part of it. So just email me at trunltd at aol.com, trunltd at aol.com. Uh, join us, be with us. We'll, we'll invite you every week. We have lots of interesting things coming up. Um, I actually let the, the, the room know earlier what I what I've got scheduled for the next three or I think three or four weeks. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll be things that'll be interest of you, interest for you. It will be of interest to you. Oh, God, I have to stop drinking. Um, and uh, and you'll come back and, and be a regular member of the community. Um, like I said earlier, we no longer are just New York centric. We really are uh, serving people all around the country and also including people from around the world. We have a particularly hardy contingency from Australia for some reason or other. We have a lot of Australians who come, who come and spend time with us. And they thank me for, for putting it at a time where it's not impossible for them. <laughs> because they're they're 14, 14 hours ahead of us. So basically they're, they're coming at 7 a.m. Now for me, that would be an impossible time. 
but for them, they, they managed to get here and, and be with us. Um, so again, join us. And we've been doing this. We started off as a community service, and we've been doing it for pay, as pay what you can. And we've been perfectly happy to have people come and be with us without without paying. However, <laughs> we're not we're a not for profit company, and we do have expenses. Um, so if you have it in your heart to do so, go to True Donate T R U Donate dot com or dot org. Either one works. Um, T R U Donate dot com and um, send us a little something just as a thank you for whatever we're doing and maybe it's of help to you and maybe things you'll hear today and here and other Fridays in this room will be of inspiration or education for you. And that's why we do it. So um, we're here to help and consider supporting us and do be with us again next week and week after and week after that. Uh, thank you all very much. <laughs>